Yeah, I was like, no, why can why can you can why can the judicial system reduce those costs for and put it on a sliding scale for those who cannot otherwise afford to to file these fees? And also, as being judges, what would you do to maybe promote such an idea so that way it, the, the system would be fair to all the people who live here and not just benefit some while denying others? Sir, that's a great question, and you know, that already is happening in certain uh, courts, and, uh, and uh, going back again to small claims court, at least in Contra Costa, because I train mediators hands-on in cases, small claims court cases in Contra Costa County, and their parties can get their fee waived uh, if they fit certain economic criteria. And may I have a little word? Oh, may, I ask, may I ask a little question? Uh, we do, do you need to make sure we get to we oh, send these, these city I'm workers sure. home? Uh, it's a, but go ahead, we'll, oh, we'll oh. respond to one, one more question. Um, so what is, what is your passion and what would you like to see happen as being judges in place for the benefit of people? Why don't you take that as a what? I'm sorry, can, can, can you repeat the question? What is, what is your, your passion and what would you like, how would you like to see the courts more be, provide more benefits to the community? Right. I, I'd like to see, uh, uh, thank you for your question. So, uh, so what was your name? Thomas? Yeah, so uh, Thomas uh, uh, made a statement earlier that I think uh, goes right to part of my passion, uh, was that um, we as judicial candidates are here at this point. You made a comment to me earlier before the started about how sometimes people uh, into the community are never seen again. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been a member of the community in San Francisco. Uh, I've been primarily in the Latino community because that's where that's where my roots <coughs> are. Uh, but in a very di disenfranchised part of the city where they need to see the judges. You know, we need to see more lawyers out of the community. Uh, so part of my passion is to kind of level the playing field, if you will, but just bring the courts. The courts should not be something that are removed, that are so expensive to get to, something that people are so frustrated that they cannot take advantage of. You know, people need to see lawyers and judges that they relate to and say, this person is just like me. And, and, and I think that, that I would continue to do uh, what I've done as a lawyer, as a judge. You know, a, as lawyers, uh, Thomas probably agrees with me this, is that we still think it's a big deal when judges come to lawyers' events, okay? Much less when they're just out in the community. Um, the position of judge is a position of service. It is one where you are here to serve the community. You cannot serve the community if you're not part of the community. Um, and that's my passion. And your passion? My passion is uh, twofold. One is to get more funding for the courts. We are the state child of city government or of government in general in the state. We need more money. We need more money. Maybe it will allow for a reduction in filing fees. We need more money for more interpreters. In San Francisco, this is uh, incredibly important because we have such a diverse, multicultural community. We need more interpreters. We need interpreters available at the ready, not where a party has to decide. Do they get their hearing today, or do they wait without an interpreter, or do they wait two weeks for a court-appointed interpreter? So that's very important. I also am passionate about, um, and this relates to our diverse community, that staff and judges need more cult cross-cultural education and understanding so that they understand folks that come before them. And this meeting with people in the community is important and a forum like this, practices like this, need to continue, not just at times of elections, but we need to find and create a structure that we can have a dialogue between the people we serve you know, and, and the people that work at the court. And then <coughs> lastly, so there is this money issue which you know, can address any number of the things that we've already talked about here, but also using more alternative dispute resolution professionals so that the process within the court can 
proceed in a more efficient fashion and people don't have to wait years you know, for their case to make it through the courts. And so I think that whole resource is just waiting out there for us to pick off the tree and plug it into the system. So that's my, those are my comments. Okay. So is it okay with you guys if we go a little longer with the question and answer? Go until about seven. What's that? Go until seven. Okay, great. So we'll go go to seven. So there, there the day. Go ahead. Um, I guess my question is: There's been a lot of controversy over false convictions. So I would like to just speak regarding those things and false convictions, along with how you slash story evidence. And um, kind of like forced confessions where people have been pretty much locked in the room with an officer until they confess. So um, I guess I'm I guess I'm wondering what you would what's your commentary on these things. Sure. Um, I mean, I think that one of the things to keep in mind, I would I would suggest is the perspective of the potential candidate. I represent the people. Forced to confess the things that they haven't done. I represent people uh, in cases where we've had partial evidence uh, and where the evidence that came out uh, was actually exonerating uh, evidence. Um, I, I say this not that it happens in every case. We all know it doesn't happen in every case. But the fact is that it does happen. Uh, and and it, it's one thing to say, I believe that such a thing can happen than to actually have experienced a situation with something like that did happen and happened here in San Francisco. Uh, whereas we, we like to believe oftentimes that none of that thing would ever happen in our beautiful city, but they sometimes do. Um, so what I can tell you is that that's a perspective that I, I, I have already experienced myself. Uh, and I'm not a one-sided candidate. I've, I've been a victim of crime myself, so is my family. Uh, so it, it, it's not that I only see one side, it's that I, I do see all uh, very vividly. Uh, and I would uh, be very conscious uh, to make sure that I'm paying attention to those types of issues because they do come up. somebody who is innocent, convicted, and losing certain freedoms as the result of a false conviction, which was the question here. <coughs> and, you know, it, it is the responsibility of the all of the players in a trial to work so that that doesn't happen. The, the lawyers need to be cognizant of the fact that there, there is always the possibility of that and of that shouldn't happen, that can happen. So the lawyers need to work on it and the judges need to work and be cognizant of that. Entrapment, you raise another question that is simply unacceptable and shouldn't be tolerated. Susan and David? Uh, yes. Um, Sometimes people have problems that are resolved more easily, but they don't know they can be resolved more easily. I was working with uh, a group of the East Bay that would have a lawyer night, that they could get a lawyer to come down to speak to a group of people, prearranged, you know, that the people would bring the relevant documents or whatever they, they would need uh, for, for these, and the lawyer would, would tell them, you know, basically some, most of the time, that uh, this could be resolved some other way with such and such, because he knew, he knew kind of how to solve the problem without the person going to court. Is that possibility over here is in the San Francisco? It was a, like I say, it was a activist community that did this. Well, and actually the Bar Association of San Francisco has that type of program, and I have volunteered on that program. And uh, so, 
so that there are um, uh, uh, there are programs like this in San Francisco. That kind of help um, is available. Do we need more of it? Yes. Um, and, and but it also drives home the point that there are all of these mediators out there that will um, volunteer their time or work mm -hmm. for community service at little or no cost to the parties involved and help them work these and resolve their problems so they don't have to file in court, hire a lawyer. Mm -hmm. They can resolve it outside of the court system. So that needs to happen. And incidentally, there are community boards and, and, where, and, and places that people can um, tap in to those mediation services within the community. Mm -hmm. It's just we could make that a little more formal, I believe, and make it part of our mm -hmm. court system. Thank you. I'd like to add something oh, yeah. to that briefly, is that we do have these programs, not only the Bar Association in San Francisco, but uh, they exist in Bayview and the Mission in different neighborhoods as well uh, in San Francisco. Uh, the problem, of course, is uh, do people find out about them? Uh, so we're, we're here in a very, uh, a very educated group of uh, concerned citizens, if you will, uh, and it's still not known as much as it should be. Uh, so uh, what we need, from my, my opinion, is to make sure that more people know that uh, these are services for San Francisco in addition to for all San Franciscans. Um, Thank you. Last question. Uh, my question is about pre-trial relief and the disproportionate impact on poor people. And as you know, the jails are full, full of poor people, not because they necessarily kill people, but because they can't afford the bail, and alternative release options haven't been given to them, granted to them, uh, such as ankle monitoring, or just lower bail, or just a release on your own recognizance. And that is something judges do have some discretion over, is pre-trial release bail. And it seems like the system is biased, and it historically has been biased against the poor. And uh, our, what are your thoughts about that, about trying to reform that system and, and have less of an adverse impact on somebody just because you have the misfortune of being poor and in the criminal justice system? From, from what I understand around that, that goes back to an economic issue. If there were a way to have more monitors and provide more monitors to parties, you know, that, that, that uh, may be part of the problem. I don't know. I don't know what the solution is on that. But it's a problem to look into, and from what I understand, uh, and I would love to learn more about the intricacies of this, uh, it sounds like uh, an economic issue. But as judges, you set the bail. You yes. actually can determine whether a poor person can wait wait for trial in jail or out of jail. You, you can help make that decision. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So it's a policy. You're, you're, yeah. you're seeing this as a policy decision. I am. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to speak to that. So my uh, my experience is uh, pretty extensive with this issue, uh, with this very issue. Uh, the way that the structure happens in, in, in the state court system is that there's a, there's a bail schedule. And that bail schedule uh, historically was for law enforcement. They were for making booking decisions uh, and to see what someone would be held on and putting into custody, despite their presumption of innocence, pending uh, what would happen next in terms of uh, whether or not the judge would grant release and under what conditions. The conditions, I think, are the big part that the judge has discretion on. I have represented individuals who uh, were actually a danger to society, but because they had enough money, they were able to just post bail. Uh, and who was watching them when they were on bail? No one at all. They could do whatever they want. They could ingest any type of substance that they wanted to, simply because they had the money to bail out. Okay? Whereas someone who has uh, a lot uh, lesser resources uh, was in, un unable to do that. So San Francisco, I would say, uh, is by far in the lead uh, of our surrounding counties, but we have a very, very long way to go. And one of the things, going back to perspective, is what is the perspective that the judges have when they take the bench? 
have they been able to see effective use of alternative monitoring programs? Uh, a, a GPS monitor that tells you where someone is going, although it's very uncomfortable for people to wear, if someone's trying to keep a job or an apartment, they would much rather do that. And if, in fact, they're not engaging in constant criminal activity, like most people who get caught up in the system are not in it as a you know, just way of life, so to speak, um, then they typically much appreciate it. And it is better for our overall society for people to stay employed, not lose their home, and not have their families out in the street because they couldn't afford to put <clears throat> close to $10,000 bail. Give these guys a big round of applause and thanks for <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, so. Okay. So there's some food in the back while these guys get set up. We do a grab jump and bring them back. And please try to be on this side of the room so you can see the screen. So I want to point to everybody who uh, we're a nonprofit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.